Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance with Maria Marola and Gary Wold, brought to you by DoublePortionInheritance.com. Since 1981, Maria heard the call of Yahuwah to become a watchman to the House of Yisrael and to those within the traditional Christian church. She was instructed to warn them against the false doctrines and pagan traditions of men. After 25 years of studying scripture, the word of Yahuwah came to Maria again in 2007 as she was called out of the corporate world to become a full-time intercessor and prophetic teacher. The name of the ministry, Double Portion Inheritance, was given to her after she received the revelation of the two houses of Israel from Ezekiel 37:16. The mission of this ministry is to bring together the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph for the return of the Messiah, Yehushua. And now, Maria Marola. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today is November 20th, 2021, and uh, we are doing a three-part series called Who Confirms the Covenant of Daniel's 70th Week. And today is going to be part two. Last week we did part one. So if you want to see the whole teaching, I highly recommend going back and listening to the first part. So last week, you know, we saw this graphic I made. It says Messiah stood in the gap between the two divided houses of Israel and repaired the breach. He caused there to be a 2000 year gap in history called the fullness of the Gentiles and that comes from Romans 11:25 and Genesis 48:19 in order to heal Israel's blindness. And so you can see in this little graphic here Abraham's animal pieces divided in half, Genesis 15:17, Jacob's house divided over Joseph's coat, Genesis 37:3, Solomon almost divides a baby with a sword, 1 Kings 3:24. Both houses of Israel are divided, 1 Kings 12. Down here, we have another picture here, uh, Messiah's garment divided by the Roman soldiers, Matthew 15, 24. And now you see the priest lighting the menorah in the temple. And if you can imagine three of these menorah branches as uh, the, the ministry of our Messiah, because his ministry was three and a half years. So if we took the menorah and we cut it in half, right, we'd have three and a half and then three and a half. Well, that's how I see Daniel's 70th week divided in half at Pentecost. Why? Because see, at Pentecost is where he completed his ministry, his earthly ministry. Most people think he completed his ministry when he died. No, because he resurrected and he remained with his disciples for 40 more days before he ascended. And he promised to send his Holy Spirit and to baptize them with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, on Pentecost. So if we divide his ministry, let's just imagine that, you know, these first three uh, menorah branches are, you know, Passover, uh, unleavened bread, first fruits when he was resurrected. And now this one is Pentecost. Now, there's a gap, a 2,000-year gap in history after that. And now when the two witnesses start their ministry, that's going to be the latter three and a half years. Okay, so they are going to, I believe they're going to pick up where our Messiah left off. They will probably begin their ministry around the Feast of Pentecost. That's the way I'm thinking that there's probably going to be a third Jewish temple built in Jerusalem. And the anti-Messiah will take away the daily sacrifices. And when he does, uh, that'll be when he sets up the abomination of desolation. And everybody will be able to see it. It'll be televised all over the world. In fact, it even says, you know, when you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, for then shall be great tribulation. And so... Most people think we're already in the tribulation. That's impossible. We're not in the tribulation yet, but we will be in the tribulation as soon as we see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. So many of you missed last week's uh, episode, so I'm going to skip through all the parts that I already covered last week, and I'm going to go to the spot where we were last week when we finished and you'll have to go back and um, listen to that if you want to get the full teaching but I'm 
scrolling down here. So, so we, we were talking about the two sisters, Rachel and Leah, and you see uh, an illustration of uh, an artist's illustration, Rachel and Leah. Okay. And, uh, so, uh, when Messiah has chosen the place of his name, right? And, and which is his holy city, Jerusalem. This is why the elect are given the name of his holy city, because the name of his city also bears his name as well. Okay. Because it says right in Deuteronomy 16, 2, 16, 6, you know, I gave all the scripture references where he says that the only place we're allowed to offer the Passover lamb is in the city where he has chosen to place his name. Okay. In the city where he's chosen to place his name, that is where um, he is in Jerusalem, right? And and the all these passages of scripture that I've highlighted tells us that that's the place where he has chosen to place his name in his holy city, Jerusalem. And so, hence Leah, she represents the bride who gives birth to the one new man child, okay? And remember in uh the book of Revelation chapter 12, there's a woman who gives birth to the one new man. In other words, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're from the kingdom of Judah or whether you're the kingdom of uh, Ephraim, you know, but Rachel, she represents the bride who was barren. At first she was barren. Now it says in Genesis 30 verse one and Isaiah 54 one, she was barren. She was not, she did not give birth to children right away. But Leah, she was more fruitful, okay? So Rachel was not spir born spiritual, uh, has not born spiritual children. Excuse me. I got a little tongue-tied there for a second. Rachel has not born spiritual children for she has not accepted Yahushua as her Messiah as of yet. Now, Rachel typifies the kingdom of Judah. Why? Why did she typify the kingdom of Judah, even though she's not the one who who birthed Judah? It was Leah who birthed Judah. Her fourth Leah's fourth son was Judah. Well, the reason why Rachel typifies the kingdom of Judah is because there's that passage of scripture in uh, in the Gospels where right after King Herod uh, killed all the baby boys, it says Rachel weeping for her children because they were not. Now why? is that in that passage of scriptures found in Jeremiah, Rachel weeping for her children because they were not. Why is that scripture passage of scripture quoted there in the gospel of Matthew where Herod kills all the baby boys? Because where was Rachel's body buried? It says in Genesis that her body was buried in Ephrat. Okay, and if you read it in the King James, it says Ephrat. Ephrat is another name for Bethlehem Judah. Okay. It's another name for Bethlehem Judah. You can look it up. So Rachel's body was buried there. Whereas Leah, her, her body was buried with her husband, Jacob. She was buried with her husband. And that's significant because in, um, Romans chapter six, we are told that the bride is buried in baptism with her husband, her bridegroom. So if you are born again and you belong to Messiah and you are his bride, you will be married, buried with your husband in baptism. Okay. So Leah, what is the preferred bride, even though Jacob didn't prefer her initially, he wanted Rachel. But, but Yahuwah showed favor towards Leah and blessed her with more children. So Leah typifies the bride that's going to be taken with Philadelphia. She typifies Philadelphia, the one who has the open door that no man can shut. Now there's another bride that still will be redeemed after what we call the rapture or the harpazo 
post-trib, not pre-trib. Okay. Um, and that'll be, Le Re uh, I'm sorry, Rachel. Those that typify Rachel will be from the, the congregation of Smyrna. Smyrna is told they have to suffer tribulation for 10 more days. Okay. And so Smyrna has to suffer tribulation 10 days. And that's during the 10 days of all. In other words, between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Okay, so Rachel has not born spiritual children, for she has not accepted Yahushua yet. So Rachel typifies those living in the land of Israel who have not accepted our Messiah yet. And there will be a remnant of Jews living in Jerusalem that will accept him during those last 10 days of all. That's why it says Smyrna must suffer tribulation for 10 days. And so they will accept him during those 10 days of all. They will be like the foolish virgins and they will go buy the oil. Remember the older, the, the wise virgin said, go and buy the oil. So the foolish virgins will do that during those 10 days. They will go buy the oil which is the oil of his name. Um, so Rachel represents the corporate bride of the Yehudim, the Jews, who are still living under the quote-unquote old covenant. They have not accepted the blood of the lamb as atonement for their sins yet, but they will. There's a remnant who will. It even tells us this in Zechariah chapter 12. It says, they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will Mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. So they will meet him at the Mount of Olives. They're not going to get taken up to heaven. They're not going to be probably not going to be given an immortal body. They'll be living throughout the millennium with their natural bodies. That's that's my um, assumption. OK, because it doesn't I don't there's only one rapture or one harpazo, you know. Um, and that happens after the three and a half year tribulation. When the two witnesses are taken up, that's the rapture. That's the harpazo. Okay. Um, so Rachel represents the Jewish people in the last days who do not take the mark of the beast. And because of this, they will be sealed in the forehead in advance until their day of redemption. So what qualifies them to be sealed? It is because they will sigh and cry at the abominations that are being done in the last days in Jerusalem. Okay, Ezekiel 9, 4, and also Revelation 7, 3. In both of these passages, we learn that there is a remnant who will be sealed in advance in their foreheads. And so, but it doesn't really identify who these are. I mean, Ezekiel 9, 4 talks about the inhabitants of Jerusalem who sigh and cry at the abominations. And that's what qualifies them to be sealed in the foreheads, that they sigh and cry. Revelation 7, 3 doesn't really explain why they're given a, a seal in their foreheads. But I am, you know, I mean, it identifies them as, as 144,000. But uh, there's two groups uh, of 144,000, I believe. There's the group in Revelation 7, and there's the group in Revelation 14, and they're different. The characteristics of the 144,000 in Revelation 7 are different from the characteristics of the 144,000 in Revelation 14. Now, I've covered that. Um, you should go and watch my video called, Who Are the 144,000? And when you watch that, you'll understand the differences between the 144,000 in Revelation 7 and the 144,000 in Revelation 14. Okay, so that's for another teaching, but uh, I wanted to throw that in there. So in Leviticus 16, the annual sacrifices on Yom Kippur in the temple involved the blood of two different animals being mixed together and then sprinkled onto the mercy seat. There's the blood of a bullock, which is symbolic of Ephraim and Leah, and that was mixed together with the blood of the goat which is symbolic of Judah and Rachel. So in other words, Ephraim typifies Leah, okay, because they're more abundant, they're more fruitful. In fact, the name Ephraim means double fruit, okay? 
So the bullock is symbolic of Ephraim, Ephraim and Leah. And then the goat is symbolic of Judah and Rachel. Okay, because you could sacrifice a goat or a lamb for uh, Yom Kippur and also for Passover. It says in Exodus 12, you can sacrifice a one-year-old lamb or a goat. So there's, you can use either one. So, but the the high priest would, uh, you know, once a year when he did the Yom Kippur sacrifice, he would sacrifice a bullock and he would use the the bullock as a sin offering for himself. He would have to cleanse himself first before conducting the sacrificial goat sacrifice. Okay. Um, Interestingly, the name Leah in Hebrew means weak eyed, but it also means cow. Okay. So it has a double meaning cow. Uh, And her name, Rachel in Hebrew means lamb. Therefore, uh, we can see the symbolism for the two houses of Israel. We can see that Rachel typifies the the goat and Leah typifies the bull, the, you know, the bullock. And so what the priest would do is he would mix the blood together. And, and this is symbolic of the two houses of Israel coming together when Messiah returns. So you see, he's going to make both families, you know, the two sisters uh, and their offspring will become one blood. They shall no longer be two separate houses. The prophet prophet Isaiah speaks of this phenomenon. This is what he says in Yeshayahu, Isaiah 11, 13. It says, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Yehuda shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Yehuda, and Yehuda shall not vex Ephraim. What is this prophecy about? Well, you see, Leah was jealous. She was envious of Rachel because she was the preferred one by Jacob. She was loved by Jacob, Jacob, but Leah was not. However, Rachel was also envious of her sister Leah because Yehuah looked with kindness upon her by giving her extra, you know, more children to compensate her for the fact that she was unloved. And I'm sure Rachel was jealous that, that Leah got to be married first. So Rachel was the first to be married. Um, and you know, he was tricked into marrying Leah. He did not, it's not who he wanted, but you know, can you imagine, you know, Rachel and Jacob thought they were going to be, you know, Join together, and instead their father Laban uh, gives the older sister first. And that was, you know, trickery on Laban's part. But uh, there's a prophetic picture to be seen in that story. So Jacob was tricked by his father-in-law Laban into marrying both sisters, which this is actually against the Torah. It says right here in Leviticus 18, 18, neither shall you take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. Okay. Now what's interesting is this term, neither shall you take a sister, uh, uh, take a wife to her sister. This phrase in the Hebrew means you're not supposed to add another wife in addition to the one you already have. Okay. So the word sister there is also includes uh, a sister in the faith. It's not just talking about a biological sister. So polygamy is wrong. Now, some of the patriarchs did it like David, like Solomon and Yahuwah didn't, you know, necessarily um, come against David for that, but Solomon took it real far and he took a thousand wives and he ended up really uh, going backwards and falling into idolatry because of it. So we know that Yahuwah does not, he's not in favor of plural marriage or polygamy, especially with understanding what this phrase means. 
neither shall you take a wife to her sister. Because that phrase sounds a little odd, to her sister, right? But when you look it up in the Hebrew, um, it's the same phrase that is used when they're describing the pattern of the tabernacle. And it says you're supposed to add the silver rings in the on the curtain pole, and you know, to hang the curtain. And it says you're supposed to add the rings next to each other, right? Like, so it's it has to do with adding ex adding an extra one, right? So you're not supposed to take a wife and add it to the one you already have. That's that's really the essence of what's being said here. To vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. So that means, okay, I can marry another woman after the his wife of his youth is dead, but he's not supposed to add a, a second one in her lifetime because this does what? This vexes, this vexes her. Now it grieves her, okay? And so you see Yahuwah in his wisdom knew what plural marriage uh, causes to both parties, which is why he did not want a man to take his sister's wife to vex her. But in spite of the fact that Jacob's marriage to both sisters violated Torah, Yahuwah ultimately used it to multiply Abraham's seed in the nations. So you see this passage, this, uh, you know, this Leviticus 18, 18, this wasn't given to Israel until after the, the account of Jacob and Leah and, and Rachel. So they didn't have the Torah commandment at that time telling them not to do this, but we see what it caused. We see the division between the two houses that ensued because of the vexation of these two sisters. What their father Laban did was, was cruel. It was heartless. These, these two sisters uh, who originally started out, I'm sure, loving each other, were became enemies in their own household because they were both fighting over the same husband. And their offspring, their children, were fighting over each other. And they all hated Joseph because he was the favored one. He was the, you know, the firstborn son born to Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And Leah's sons hated him for it because Jacob showed favoritism. So you see, this can never work. Plural marriage is always going to cause strife. Um, so in these last days, Yahuwah is going to bring both the children of Rachel and the children of Leah back together again. This means that Judah typified in Rachel, okay? The kingdom of Judah is typified in Rachel, shall no longer vex Ephraim. And Ephraim is typified in Leah. And Ephraim typified in Leah shall no longer envy Judah. So in other words, it's going to be like, you know, Rachel will no longer uh, vex uh, her sister Leah and uh, Leah will no longer envy her sister Rachel. Okay. So these two families will finally live in harmony with one another when Messiah returns. This is why the animal pieces in Abraham's covenant were divided. Okay. Because Yahuwah saw in advance that the two kingdoms were going to be divided in, in order to restore the schism in both houses, what did he do? He walked between the pieces, okay? He walked between the pieces because he knew that in the future, these two houses would be divided. So what did he do? He stood in the gap. He, he repaired the breach, and this is also why in the midst of the week, this is in the middle of the last seven years of Daniel's 70th week, it was divided into two parts of three and a half years. Okay. So in other words, Yahushua, it says that in the midst, middle of the week, he was cut off. 
You see, it says that that he caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Um, now, he caused it to cease, um, you know, in the future after the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. But for 40 more years, they continued to conduct the sacrifices in the temple. Um, but they failed. Every time they did the Yom Kippur sacrifice, once per year, uh, something happened. The red ribbon failed to turn white. Uh, the, the temple doors kept swinging open and the fire kept going out on the brazen altar. And they knew it was a, like this ominous thing. They knew the, the rabbis wrote in the Jewish Talmud, we know that that were under judgment. They knew they were under ju judgment. They just didn't know why, which baffles me because, I mean, Yahushua said to them 40 years earlier, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone all the prophets that are sent unto you, how many times would I have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chickens and you would not come to me? And then he says, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. So by his spoken word, he's the one that determined that Jerusalem would be desolate. And so 40 years after he sp speaks this prophetic word, the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. And it was because they rejected Yahushua, who was the sacrifice the sacrifice is what sanctifies the altar in the temple. Had they accepted him, he would have set up his kingdom at that time and the animal sacrifices would not have stopped. See, people misunderstand why the animal sacrifices stopped. You know, in Christianity, they think, oh, well, you see under the Old Testament, animal blood took sins away. But now, under the New Testament, it's the blood of Jesus that takes away sins. No, no, no. They, they, they're missing the point. Yahushua was always that lamb that took the sins away from the foundations of the world. Okay, we, we learn that in Scripture. It even says in the book of Hebrews that the works were finished before the foundations of the world. The works were already finished. Okay. But it says that he manifested in these last days for us, for our benefit, so that we could see it, so that we would have a visual picture of him as the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So animal blood never took sins away, not even in the Mosaic covenant, not even in the tabernacle of Moses. They never took sins away. They were always meant to be a visual picture uh, an object lesson, if you will, of that lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So sacrifices in the temple, all of them, not all of them are for, are for sin. The evening and the morning sacrifices, those are done as an act of worship, as an act of worship. They were, they were never done for sin. And a lot of people misunderstand that. So when Yahushua comes back and sets up his millennial reign, He's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. And yes, animal sacrifices will resume. And when I say that, people go, oh, oh my goodness, why? Why would you? Oh, you know, they, they misunderstand because all the animal sacrifices are meant to point us to him. And why do you think he said this do in remembrance of me. He wasn't talking about a Catholic communion wafer that you go to church and take on Sunday mornings. No, he was talking about the Passover lamb. When he said, do this in remembrance of me, he's talking about every year when you slaughter a lamb for Passover, do it in remembrance of me. So moving forward, after he died on the tree, he says, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't mean a little Catholic communion wafer. He meant you're going to continue to celebrate Passover. You're going to continue to slaughter the lamb for Passover. And you're going to 
do all the things it says to do in Exodus 12, but this time you're going to do this in remembrance of me. Okay, so in the new millennium, it's going to be the same way. When we slaughter animals, we're going to be doing it in remembrance of him. Okay, now not all of them are for sin. Uh, it, it Some of them are for worship. Some of them have all different sacrifices, have different purposes of different meanings. I'm not going to go into that with this teaching. But in, in Daniel 9, 27, what was determined against Jerusalem? It Desolation is determined, it says, because it was already determined by our Messiah, Yahushua, and the prophets. But what caused them to be made desolate? Well, it was because they rejected the sacrifice of their Messiah. You see, it was his sacrifice that sanctified the altar in the temple. If they had accepted his sacrifice, the altar would not have become defiled. The altar would have been sanctified. But because they rejected his sacrifice, their altar remained defiled for the next 40 years. Okay? The house of Judah crucified him and proclaimed let his blood be upon us. So they rejected his sacrifice. In Metat Yahu 27, 25, it says, and then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. In Luke 23, 21, it says, but they cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. In Hebrews strong, in the Hebrew strong concordance, the word for cease in Daniel 9.27 is number 76.73, okay? Uh, and that word is Shabbat. But look what it says for this definition. It says to repose, to desist from exertion, used in many implied relations, a causative, figurative, or specific. Uh, cause to let, to make, Cease, okay, to fail. This is a, a, a good one right here, to fail. In other words, they continued to practice the sacrifices after he died. But even though they continued to practice them, they failed. In the eyes of the Father in heaven, the Yom Kippur sacrifice once per year is really the only sin sacrifice for the whole nation. And that sacrifice failed. So every year when the priest was supposed to cast lots to see which goat was to be killed and which goat was to be sent into the wilderness, and he was supposed to cast lots to see whether the people of the, of the nation were accepted, if their sacrifice was acceptable, the white stone came up. If it was unacceptable, the black stone came up. Well, for 40 consecutive years, the black stone came up every time. And mathematically, the odds of that were 5,000 to 1. Okay, I, I have another teaching on that, and that's how I re I'm coming up with this statistic because I, I studied this intensely. But uh, so it failed. It suffered it to suffer to be lacking. Okay, so they continued the sacrifices for 40 more years until 70 AD. However, they failed in the eyes of the Father. So when it says he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, most Christians think that's talking about the Antichrist, the anti Mashiach. Actually, it's talking about our Messiah. He's the one that caused the sacrifices and the oblations to no longer be acceptable to the Father because why? The only one who could sanctify the altar was Messiah. It was his blood that cleanses the altar and makes every sacrifice they do in the temple acceptable. But because they rejected him, moving forward, every sacrifice failed. Okay. So um, a lot of Christians misunderstand and they'll say, oh, well, you know, in the Old Testament, it was the blood of animals that took our sins away. No, that never was the case. 
It even says in the book of Hebrews, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. We know this. It is not possible that the animal blood should take away sins. Would you agree that it would be more appropriate to think of animal blood and the sin sacrifices more as a promissory note? Sure. Or or a, something that just staved off, satisfied temporarily? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like an IOU, <laughs> sort of, you know. But like I said, I mean, he already paid the price in eternity. And once, you know, once we understand that, then it's not like we have to wait for some future sacrifice. You know what I mean? It's like we have to recognize that he was always that lamb slain. Okay. Um, so, like I said, the word cease in Daniel 9, 27 is synonymous with fail, to suffer, to be lacking. Um, our Messiah's death on the cross was meant to sanctify the altar in the temple, thereby making the evening and the morning oblations acceptable before Yahuwah. However, since the leadership of the house of Yehuda and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did not recognize him as their Messiah, the daily sacrifices were no longer acceptable to Yahuwah. Okay, why? Because it's the, it's the sacrifice that sanctifies the altar. Okay, so their altar remained defiled. So if, but like I said, had they accepted him as a nation, he would have continued to, they would have continued to do the sacrifices with him as their high priest. He would have stepped in as Melchizedek as the, uh, you know, the righteous high priest, Melchizedek, which means king and priest. And they would have continued. Okay. But because the nation did not accept him, then he had to allow their sacrifice and oblations to cease or to fail in their purpose. Okay. Had they accepted his atonement, the evening and morning oblations would have then been done as an act of worship acceptable before Yahuwah. They would have been done as a memorial of his death, burial, and resurrection, not as a substitute for sin. You see, the sin offering is different than the morning and evening sacrifices, which are not performed for sin. They are performed as an act of worship. However, Yahuwah no longer accepted their act of worship in the temple because they were guilty of innocent blood. See, it tells us in Numbers chapter 19 that whenever they shed innocent blood as a nation, the whole nation bears the guilt of that innocent blood. Even if some people weren't in favor of, you know, the, the, his, uh, you know, crucifixion, even there were, you know, his disciples did not agree with the crucifixion, but you see the guilt fell upon the whole nation. And what was done whenever there was, you know, uh, innocent blood shed in the nation is they had to kill a red heifer. Okay. Which is described in numbers 19 it says here in numbers 19, this is the ordinance of the Torah, the law, which Yahuwah has commanded saying, speak unto the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish and upon which never came a yoke. So Yahushua therefore is the one who caused the sacrifice in the oblation to cease to be acceptable before Yahuwah. You see, the sacrifice of the red heifer is for the cleansing of the altar, and it is the only sacrifice which is done outside the camp of the city of Jerusalem, not in the temple. The red heifer must be at least three and a half years. Okay, now the Jewish Talmud says preferably three and a half years. Okay, so they want, because they want to make sure that it's exactly, it's not, you know, they're not getting too dangerously close to it not being three years old, right? Now, Yahushua fulfilled the three and a half years. And we know that his ministry lasted for three and a half years, okay? He was cut off in the middle of the last seven years of Daniel's 70th week. It says cut off in the midst of the week, Passover week. Not only was he cut off in the middle of the literal week, which would have been like a Wednesday, what we would today call Wednesday, the fourth day of the week. But he was also cut off in the middle of the seven years, the last seven years of this prophecy. 
is a total of 490 years. But the last seven years, he was cut off in the middle of that. So we only have three yet, three and a half years left to go. Okay. Do you remember when the patriarch Jacob um, loved only the one woman, Rachel? However, he was tricked into marrying Leah, her older sister. When he discovered that he had married Leah instead of Rachel, he confronted his father-in-law and essentially asked him, why did you trick me? This was the reply that Laban gave him. It comes from Bereshit, Genesis 29. He says, fulfill her week and we will give you this also for the service which you shall serve with me yet other seven years. So he says, finish the week with Leah. Okay. And he says, and he tells him, which you shall serve me yet another seven years. Okay. But then it says, Jacob, Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And he gave him Rachel, his daughter to wife also. Now I used to think this meant that Jacob had to work 14 years before he could even have Rachel. No, he finished the literal week, the literal seven days. Cause you know, an ancient Hebrew Wedding is seven days long. So he fulfilled the seven day honeymoon with Leah. And then he got to be married to Rachel also in the same week. At the end of the week, he got to marry Rachel also. So he got both brides in the same week. But he still had to agree. He had to verbally agree to work another seven years. And he did. He worked another seven years for Rachel, but he was already married to her. Okay. And so Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. And he gave him Rachel, his daughter to wife. So after he fulfilled the seven day week, the literal week with Leah, he gave him Rachel, his daughter to wife also. Okay. Because you have to understand. If he worked seven years before he could marry Leah, you got to imagine that probably when he met these two sisters, Jacob, um, they were probably like 14 years old, 15 years old. They're pretty young. So when if he had to wait till they till they were like 21, you know, who knows? They were probably just maybe a year apart, maybe a couple years apart. I don't know. But I'm imagining they were probably like, you know. 14, 15 years old. And Jacob wasn't that old himself yet, but he had to wait till he was 21 or that maybe they were like 21, 22, who knows, something like that to marry Leah. And if they would have waited until Rachel was like, you know, 30 years old, I mean, she would have lost all those years of childbearing. So I don't, I can't imagine that he would have waited that long before he could have Rachel. She would have started to been starting to get old at that point. Okay. For that time anyway. So what we see here is a pattern of Yahushua working for one week. In other words, seven years. Sorry, my, uh, my cursor sometimes does that. It moves so fast. It just gets away from me. Okay. So what we see here is a pattern of Yahushua working for one week, seven years for his beloved Rachel the kingdom of Judah, but he did not get what he worked for. In the same way, our Messiah did not get what he came for. You see, it says here in Yehuchanan or John 1.11, it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. So he came thinking he was going to get win the Jewish people, his own people, the kingdom of Judah, and they did not receive him. So what does he do? He ends up being disappointed because now the gospel, his message goes out to the Gentiles. Same thing happened to him that happened to Jacob. Jacob thinks he's getting Rachel, who typifies the kingdom of Judah. Instead, the wedding night, on the wedding night, he realizes he, he married the wrong sister. And of course, their face was covered during the ceremony. He didn't get to find out who he married until after the next morning. He didn't realize who he married until the next morning. Of course, I'm sure they probably pumped him up with lots of alcohol so that, you know, he wouldn't notice. 
probably that's what Jacob did or Laban did. Probably gave him lots of alcohol to drink so he wouldn't notice. Uh, so Yahushua came the first time for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, that's Matthew 10, 6. These were the tribes who'd been divorced. They were divorced by Yahuwah in Jeremiah 3, 8 because of their idolatry and their harlotry. However, the Jewish nation as a whole did not receive him. That is when he was given in marriage first to the Gentiles who symbolize Leah. Okay, so when the kingdom of Judah rejected him, who accepted the gospel message? The Gentiles, for the most part. I'm not saying there were no Jews that accepted the gospel. Of course, there was the Jewish apostles, and there were quite a few Jews living in the nation at that time that did accept the gospel message. But as far as the leadership, you know, as a whole, the leadership as a whole did not accept the gospel. Okay, so which covenant did Messiah confirm? Okay, so in order to understand the continuity of the everlasting covenant, we must go back to the beginning in the book of uh, Bereshit Genesis, which literally means in the beginning. Yahuwah first established a covenant with who? Abraham and his seed, Yitzhak, Isaac. And then Isaac had twins by Rebekah, Esau and Jacob. And then finally, Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons by his two wives, Rachel and Leah, and their maids, their handmaids. Jacob's favorite son born to him by his beloved Rachel was Yehusaf, Joseph. And it is through him that we begin to see the future of Israel begin to unfold. See, the patriarch Yehusaf, Joseph, was sent far away in a Gentile nation, Egypt. And he was estranged from his father and 11 brothers. Joseph was a prophetic type of our Messiah whose gospel was sent to the Gentile nations after his brothers. The nation of Israel rejected his message. When Joseph was in Egypt, he was given a hidden name. That hidden name is Zephnath Paneah. Okay, so he's a type of Messiah. Joseph was given a hidden name while he was in Egypt. Our Messiah was also given a hidden name by the pagan masses, which began as Jesus. See, they what they did was the Greeks um, put a letter Y in front of the the name Zeus, and you know, trying to insinuate that Yah is Zeus because why they called their supreme deity Zeus. It would be like in our modern vernacular, we say God, G-O-D. But God is the name of a pagan deity uh, from ancient Babylon. It's the God of fortune. He's the, he's the you know, it's spelled G-A-W-D, God, but it sounds the same, God, you know. And so our Messiah was given a hidden name too by the Greeks. Uh, in the Septuagint, the Greek Septuagint, they spelled it as Iosus. Now, the Roman Emperor Constantine changed that letter to a letter H, so it was Hesus, Hesus Krishna, until finally it was spelled as Jesus by the English translators when the letter J was added to the alphabet in the 1500s. So there's another blog you can read about that. It's called does the name Jesus really come from Zeus? So Joseph was also given an Egyptian or Gentile bride by the Pharaoh. In the same way, our Messiah was given a Gentile bride, the Christian church. Okay. And their offspring became a multitude of nations, just like Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's two sons. Uh, when Jacob prophesied over his two grandsons, he said that Ephraim would become a multitude of nations. So Joseph's two sons, born to him by the Egyptian wo women, woman, excuse me, was grafted in. They were these two grandsons were grafted into the original twelve sons of Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel. Their grandfather Jacob, when he declared upon them, he said, "Let my name." be named upon them. That's in Genesis 48, 16. You see, 
Jacob's eyes were growing dim and he was getting old. And, you know, Joseph brings his grandsons to be blessed by his father, Jacob. And he says, who are these? And it's interesting because Jacob had already been living in the land of Goshen for many years. He should have known who the grandsons were by that point. But he's starting to get dementia. You see, he's old and he's starting to get dementia. His eyes are growing dim. And he says, who are these? And, and, Jay, and Joseph has to tell him, he says, these are my sons who have born in this place. And so it's like Jacob, um, you know, doesn't recognize Joseph's two sons until what? Until he places his name on them. And that's the same thing with our father in heaven. He, he doesn't recognize us Gentiles until we're born again by the blood of the lamb and, and he places his name on us. See, the name is important because it's the name that identifies who we are. Okay. Uh, in the same way, the heavenly father has grafted in together the spiritual offspring from the marriage between our Messiah, Yahushua and the Gentiles saying to these people, let my name be named upon them. Jacob gave his grandson Ephraim the inheritance of the entire house of Israel, which includes Rachel's two sons, as well as Leah's 10 sons. When he declared that Ephraim would become a multitude of nations, Genesis 48, 19, Jacob also declared that Joseph was going to receive a double portion, one extra portion above his brethren. Okay, so he told Joseph, you shall receive an extra uh, double portion of my inheritance. I have given you one extra portion above your brothers. Joseph's inheritance would later on be realized through his youngest son, Ephraim, when the good news of Messiah was preached to the nations. This is how Ephraim became the tribal leader over all the house of Israel and his Gentile companions. Okay, and this is you know, spoken of in, in Ezekiel 37, 16. Ephraim's name means double fruit in Hebrew. And though he was the youngest and the least fruitful spiritually, he would later on become born again through Messiah's blood. This is when he would finally live up to this prophecy that was spoken over him. In Jeremiah 31, 9, he says, Ephraim is my firstborn. He calls Ephraim my firstborn. Why? Because after the Messiah's uh, kingdom, you know, when he was here on earth, who accepted the gospel after he died on the cross? It was the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are likened unto Ephraim. They became a multitude of nations. See? And so Leah's son, Judah, is to this day the lawgiver over the children of Israel or the literal descendants of Jacob. However, Ephraim represents all the house of Israel, which is not only the literal descendants of Jacob, but also the Gentiles who are then added to the house or the family by becoming grafted into the olive tree, Israel, through hearing the good news of Messiah. In Ezekiel 37, 16, we see the language that's being used um, of the children of Israel. When it comes to describing the stick of Judah, it says the children of Israel. Yet we see the language, all the house of Israel, when the stick of Ephraim is being described. Why is there a distinction here? So you see, whenever he talks about the stick of Judah, he says the children of Israel. And when he's talking about the stick of Ephraim, he says all the house of Israel, right? Okay, the distinction is that the that the term children refers, refers to Jacob's literal 12 sons. And Judah was their spiritual leader. He was their lawgiver. Remember what he said? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And then we have the house of Israel, which refers to the added members. The added members would be Joseph's two sons. So they were added. They were the companions. 
They became part of the family through the engrafting process. Later on in 1 Kings 12, we can see that there was a division that took place when the two houses of Israel became two separate nations. The ten northern tribes were ruled under King Jeroboam, and the two southern tribes were then ruled under King Rehoboam, Solomon's son. From that point on, we see that the ten northern tribes of Israel became known by the prophets as Ephraim, and the two southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah became known as Judah. Okay, so in these last days, however, these two houses of Israel are brought back together as one house through our Messiah, Yahushua. Our Messiah's offspring by the Gentile woman in the nations. Okay, in other words, the Gentiles in the nations are sort of like when Joseph married an Egyptian woman. Okay, so his offspring by the Gentile woman in the nations is just like Joseph's youngest son, Ephraim. After the two kingdoms of Israel split in 1 Kings 12, the house of Ephraim became known for their rebellion and their idolatry with pagan sun worship. And we, we know because the prophet Isaiah, or Hosea, I should say, um, says Ephraim is known for his idolatry. So Ephraim became known for their idolatry. And we have a picture there of King Solomon and offering up his idols in the temple. Because he built lots of heathen temples for his many wives. Okay, uh, we're only going to go for a few more minutes and then we're going to stop and take questions. So bear with me a little longer. So our Messiah's offspring by the Gentile woman in the nations, like I said, is like Joseph's youngest son, Ephraim. The same thing is true even to this day with the Christian church. They are still following pagan holidays, just like the ones instituted by King Jeroboam. Only now it's through the papacy who instituted Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day, Halloween, Sunday Sabbath, etc. Our Messiah came to first call the lost sheep home out of their idolatry and exile, and then he came to confirm the covenant promised to the two houses of Israel. Yidamiyahu, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, says Yahuwah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, which is Ephraim, okay, and with the house of Yehuda, Judah. So anytime you see the house of Israel described in scripture, it's talking about Ephraim. But whenever you see the house of Judah, of course, that's the kingdom of Judah. So you'll notice here in this prophecy that the word new, okay, the new covenant is with two distinct groups. It never says that he's making a new covenant with the Christian church, okay? He says he will make a new covenant with Israel and with Judah, okay? The house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. The word new in this passage is this word in Hebrew, hadash, hadash, which means to renew, to rebuild, and repair. That's really what it means. So it's not an entirely different covenant, which is what Christianity t- teaches. They say, oh, it's not the same covenant. Look, it's, it's, it's the same covenant in the sense that it's the same requirements. The same commandments are required to be obeyed. What makes it different, though, is that Messiah renewed it with his own blood. So that's the difference. But it's when he calls it a renewed covenant, it means to renew, to rebuild, and to repair. So that's what Messiah came to do, to renew, to rebuild, and repair the broken covenant. In other words, there was a, there was a breach. There was a gap. And he came to rebuild and repair that breach. Now we understand that Yahushua came to confirm the covenant, to renew that covenant, which was promised to these two houses. In, in Abram, or, um, Hebrews 8.8, 8, it says, for finding fault with them. Who's he referring to when he says them? Well, if you read the entire chapter of Hebrews 8, 
He's referring to the priesthood, the Le the Levites. He says, for finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days come, says Yahuwah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, uh, which is Ephraim, and with the house of Yehuda, Judah. Okay. Now, I just want to pull this up on my e-sword real quick so you understand something about this verse. It's in Hebrews 8.8. 8. Uh, let me find it here. Hebrews 8.8. 8. Okay. So, uh, whenever you see the word, whenever you see a word italicized in the King James Version of the Bible, it means that word was not there originally. Okay. The King James translators inserted the word. So here's what it says just for context. Uh, it says, but now has he obtained a more excellent ministry. This is speaking of Messiah, who's our pre high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay. So right here, it says they put the word covenant in there. Okay. So when you read this, it says, for if that first had been faultless, then no place, uh, then should no place ha have, have no place have been sought for the second. So the point is that he, why would Yahuwah give us a faulty covenant? Why would he give Israel a faulty covenant and then blame them when they didn't keep it or didn't stick to it. I'm telling you, I do not believe he gave them a faulty covenant. That's why this verse, for if that first had been faultless, I don't believe it should be talking about the covenant being faultless. It's talking about the priesthood. Okay. Because the context is all about the priesthood. Because right up in, in the beginning here, it says, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifice. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man has something to offer. Okay, now the King James says somewhat. Somewhat in our modern vernacular doesn't sound like something good. It's like, ah, somewhat, you know, like halfway, sort of, you know. But in King James vernacular, it means something. This man has something also to offer. Okay. And then it says, for if he were a priest, if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law or the Torah. Now, some people think this means he wasn't acting in his role as Melchizedek while he was here because of this verse. But what this verse is really saying is that because if he were born like other people, if he was born, if he wasn't, hadn't been born of a virgin, if he wasn't of heavenly origin, if he was just like one of us, he would not be a priest, okay? Because if he was an earthly, if he was from the earth, in other words, he was an earthly carnal person like us, not born of a virgin, not born of heavenly means by the, conceived by the Holy Spirit, he, he couldn't have been a priest because he was born into the kingdom of Judah. Okay. So uh, Judah did not qualify to be a high priest. Only the Levites were qual qualified to be a high priest. But since he is a heavenly priest from eternity, Melchizedek, who has neither beginning of days nor end of life, of course, he's allowed to be the high priest because he's Melchizedek and Melchizedek is eternal. He always existed in eternity. And he met with Abraham. Uh, so he is that eternal priest that is allowed to offer gifts uh, on the altar in eternity on our behalf. So this whole chapter is about the priesthood. So I contend to you that I submit to you that Hebrews 8, 7 should say, for if that first priesthood had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay. So 
it's not that the covenant was fault was faulty. Why would Yahuwah give his bride a faulty covenant and then blame her when she can't keep it? But look what he says right after he, this. Hebrews 8, 8, it says for finding fault with them, not it. If he's talking about the covenant being faulty, he would have said for finding fault with it. But no, he says for finding fault with them, meaning who? The priesthood, the Levites. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says Yahuwah, when I will make a renewed covenant, a hadash. Brit hadasha is how you say it in Hebrew. Brit meaning covenant. Hadasha meaning renewed. Covenant renewed. I will make a covenant renewed with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Okay. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Mitzrayim or Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, says Yahuwah. So when he says not according to the covenant I made with their fathers, what he means is, okay, the terms and conditions haven't changed. We're still required to keep the same commandments. When he says, not according to the covenant I made with our fathers, he's talking about the fact that, you know, the covenant was presented in stone tablets. Now the, the covenant is not presented to us in stone. It's presented to us in fleshy tables of the heart. Remember what the apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 3? He says that the covenant is, has been written in our hearts. It's been transferred from tables of stone into fleshy tables of the heart. That's what's different. But the requirements of keeping the law of Moses are still there. It's not a different covenant in that regard. It's only different in the form. It comes to us in a different form. It's just like, you know, back in the day, we would read paperback books. Nowadays, we read ebooks, right? We have books formatted on our computer. We could read an ebook on our phone or on our tablet. It's the same type of thing. It's like the form, the form in which it comes to us is different. It's no longer in stone. It's been given to us in fleshy tables of the heart. In other words, when, the, when we receive the Holy Spirit, he writes the law of Moses in our hearts and in our minds. Okay. And so, you know, right here in Hebrews 8, 13, he says, in that he says a new, and you see that word covenant's not even there. It's italicized. In that he says a new, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. It hasn't vanished away yet. He says ready to vanish away. What does he mean when he says ready to vanish away? In other words, after the millennium, after the millennium, then the first heaven and the first earth will pass away. And what did our Messiah tell us in Matthew 5, 17 through 19? He says, until heaven and earth passes away, not one jot or tittle, not one punctuation mark of the law and prophets, Torah and prophets will be done away with until when? Till heaven and earth passes away. And when does that happen? Well, in Revelation 21, it says, for I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And that's after the thousand year reign. After. Okay. So it's, you know, this word covenant shouldn't even be there. And that he says a new, he has made the first old. What's he talking about? He's not talking about the covenant. He's talking about the priesthood. A new, in other words, it's going to be a new priesthood. After the order of Melchizedek, we're going to be serving with him for a thousand years. And at the end of that, the new heaven and the new earth is going to come down. We're going to continue to be the lively stones, the living stones that make up the new Jerusalem. Okay. And that has not decayed yet. It has not become old yet, but it will vanish away at the end of the millennium. So we still have a thousand years of this Levitical system that's going to continue 
during the millennium, but Yahushua is still going to be the high priest over the Levites, and he's also going to be the high priest over the uh, royal priesthood of Melchizedek, which we who are born again are part of. You know, 1 Peter 2, th uh, 3, 9 says, we are a royal priesthood. It tells us that we are his royal priesthood. Our first Peter three nine. Um, no, I got the wrong passage. Where is it? First Peter three three. Sorry, uh, let me look it up real quick. Um, there we go. First Peter two nine. I said three, nine, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. All during the millennium, he's going to call his people, his resurrected ones, the ones that put on incorruption, kings and priests. Okay. That's in Revelation. It says we shall be called kings and priests. And that's right here in Revelation 1, 6 and Revelation 5, 10. Okay. So we are going to be his royal priesthood after the order of Melchizedek in the new, in the millennium. Um, and, but he's also going to rule over the Levites. The Levites will also be functioning together with the Melchizedek priesthood all throughout the millennium. It's going to be the same as David's tabernacle was. David had the Zadok, he had the, you know, the Zadok priesthood, and he also had the, uh, you know, the, the Zadok means righteous, you know, and he also had the sons of Aaron working side by side with each other, okay? So now we get a better understanding of what he came to confirm, okay? He came to confirm the covenant with many for one week. And so after Yahuwah divorced the 10 northern tribes of Israel, which is Ephraim, they were sent into the nations. They became known as Gentiles. The Hebrew word for Gentile literally means a heathen nation. So a lot of Christians say, well, I'm a Gentile. Oh, so you're calling yourself a heathen? <laughs> they don't know who they are. They, they have an identity crisis. They call themselves heathens. I'm a Gentile. I'm a heathen. Okay. Well, if Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter two, you who are once Gentiles in the flesh are no longer strangers. You are now part of the common wealth of Israel. OK. So it was because these 10 tribes were outside of the covenant that the house of Judah thought it was their job to keep them out of the land instead of trying to win them back. Therefore, the rabbis invented man-made ordinances which prevented the Gentiles from coming near to the temple. Okay, these Gentiles had, re had to remain outside of the outer court. This was to ensure that they did not come near so that they would hear the reading of the Mosaic law, the Torah. Instead of giving these Gentiles a chance to repent and be restored back to the covenant, the house of Yehuda, Judah, built up a middle wall of partition around the outer court that would keep them under punishment of death. They would be kept out under punishment of death. So this was a rabbinic ordinance referred to by Paul, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Sorry, my, my uh, mouse got away from me. This was a rabbinic ordinance by Paul called the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Ephesians 2.15 this was against the Gentiles, the divorced tribes. This is what um, Messiah nailed to the cross. He didn't nail the Mosaic law, the Torah to the cross. Okay. The law of commandments contained in ordinances. Let's, let's look that up. Uh, law of commandments contained in ordinances. Okay. It says right here, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that word enmity means hatred, uh, rivalry, even the law of 
commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of two one new man so making peace so what you have there is that the kingdom of judah kept the other tribes out they kept them out of the temple they weren't allowed to come near they weren't allowed to come near if they if the gentiles you know the samaritans they were from the house of ephraim they were the 10 part of the 10 lost tribes if the samaritans came near they would stone them to death they weren't allowed to come near okay so that was the enmity. There was hatred between the Jews and the Gentiles, the Jews and the Samaritans. They weren't allowed to come near. Why did the Jews do this? Well, in their minds, they thought they were being righteous because it says right here in Deuteronomy 24, when a man has taken a wife and married her and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it into her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hates her and writes her a bill of divorcement and gives it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before Yahuwah, and shall, and you shall not cause the land, the land to sin, which Yahuwah your Elohim gives you for an inheritance. So you see, in the eyes of the Jewish people, the kingdom of Judah, they saw the ten lost tribes who left the kingdom of David. Right in First Kings twelve, they they left the kingdom of David and they went uh, north and were ruled by King Jeroboam. They became known as the 10 Northern tribes. They looked at them as, okay, Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 3, 8, that they are divorced. These 10 tribes are divorced. And now they went after their false pagan gods. They married their, they got married to their Baalim. It says in Hosea chapter two, that they were married to their false gods, their false deities. And, and he says, but in the last days, they will come back to Yahuwah and they will say, you know, I will go back to my first husband for then it was better with me than now. Well, the fact that they said they'll go back to their first husband implies that they might have had a second husband. Why would they say I will go back to my first husband unless there was a second husband? You see, the northern tribes, they got married to their false deities. And in the last days, it says they, that they will say, I will go back to my first husband, for then it was better with me than now. That's in Hosea chapter 2. And let me find it right here. Hosea chapter 2. Okay. Um, and it says, as she followed after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek after them, but not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband. For, for then it was better with me than now. So it, it's like in Deuteronomy 24, it says she can't ever get married to the first husband. According to the Torah, she's not allowed to get married to the first husband because that would cause the land to sin. But now in Hosea, it says that she will return back to her first husband. And not only that, he even says, in that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth. It will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth you unto me forever. Yes, I will betroth you unto me in righteousness and in judgment and loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth you unto me in faithfulness and you shall know Yahuwah. Okay, so he's promising to marry them again, even though Deuteronomy 24 says that's not possible. So I understand why the Jewish people thought it was their job to keep the, you know, the divorced tribes out. In their minds, it was like, oh, they're going to cause the land to sin. 
we can't let these divorced tribes come back because they'll make the land to sin. So they were right in a way because they were adhering to Torah, but they were forgetting about what prophecy says in the book of Hosea. So you see, they were not, they were so strict to the letter of the law, they missed the prophetic. That's why they missed Messiah. They didn't recognize him. They were so strict with the letter of the law, they weren't interpreting the things of the spirit, the prophecies. See, because Yahushua was the one that made it possible for them to be married to him again. And how did he do that? Well, how was it that he, that that the lost tribes that were divorced in Jeremiah 3, 8, how could they get married to him again? Well, right here it tells us in Romans 7, he says, Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Messiah, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should be bring forth fruit unto Elohim. So you see what he's saying here is that, that even though he divorced Israel, Israel he, when he died, when when the husband dies, right? What happens? The law that prevented them from being restored to him, even the law of divorce dies with him. Okay, that's why it says, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. He doesn't say the law in general, meaning she's free from having to keep the law of Moses. That's how most Christians read this. Oh, she doesn't have to keep the law of Moses anymore. No, no, no. If her husband is dead, she's free from what law? The law of Deuteronomy 24. The law that prevents her from being married to him again. That's the law she's free from. Okay? <laughs> that law. That's why he calls it that law. Not the law, that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law. What law? The law of divorce. The law from Deuteronomy 24. We're dead to that law that prevented us from getting married to him again. Okay? By the body of Messiah, that we can be married to him again, the one who is raised from the dead. So he made it possible for the lost sheep to be married to him again, even though the Torah says that once he divorces that wife and she marries another man, she can never return. So the Torah says she's not allowed to return, but the prophets say that she will return. And how? How's it possible, Yahushua? bridges the gap. He bridges the gap between law and prophets. He's the one that bridges that gap. Okay. And this is how he confirmed the renewed covenant that was prophesied about in Jeremiah 31, 31. When our Messiah died on the tree, the law of divorce, Deuteronomy 24, one through three, which prevented the lost tribes from returning to Yahuwah also died with him, thereby allowing the divorced wife to return to the living husband when she resurrected or when he resurrected, excuse me. Um, and so this, I highly recommend reading this other blog called Commonly Misunderstood Phrases by Paul. And next week, we'll start with this section called The Witness of Three and Daniel's 70th Week Prophecy. And uh, we have a little bit more to go and before this blog is finished. It's a quite lengthy blog, I'll admit that. 
but it goes into a lot of detail about the covenant. It's really uh, in depth. So, you know, if you want to go and start reading it on your own during the week until next week, uh, when we do part three, I highly recommend it because you'll get a lot out of it. And so we're finished for the day and next week we'll pick up with part three. So does anybody have any comments or questions? Please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask away. I just have one. Sure. <laughs> Real quickie. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you talk about the virgins and the, the five without the oil. Uh-huh. Because um, maybe some people might think that they need to literally get oil to put in their lamps. But mm -hmm. that's not the case, right? What they need, what you're saying, I believe, is that they need to learn his name. Right, right, exactly. Song of Solomon, 1-3. It says right here, because of the good savor of your, because of the savor of your good ointments, your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you. And so if you look at that word in Hebrew for ointments, it's number 8081, Shemin, okay? And that word is olive oil, grease. Um, from the olive. So it's the oil and of his name, which the word name is very similar. It's Shemin. Sounds very similar. It's the same as the, it's Shem, excuse me. Shem is name and Shemin is ointment. So it's the Shemin mm -hmm. of Hashem, the oil of his name. And he says, and so they're saying because of the fragrance, of your good ointment. Your name is like oil poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you? So this gives us a huge clue about the, the oil in the lamps of the virgins. Mm -hmm. And Matthew 25 is where we see the parable of the virgins. And I'll, I'll just briefly read it so we can revisit this and get better understanding. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto 10 virgins. And that's the 10 Northern tribes. Anytime we see the, the number 10, it's depicting the 10 divorced tribes, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and see, where does wisdom come from? The Torah, right? He says, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. But he, so they were wise because why they had they were keeping Torah and also the number five represents the five books of Moses. So mm -hmm. they were so five of them were wise and five were foolish. In other words, both groups are keeping Torah, but one group is keeping Torah and they're wise. The other group are keeping Torah, but they're foolish. Now, why? OK, they're keeping Torah, but they're missing something. They're missing his name, the oil of his name. And so taking us to the book of Revelation, chapter three, now we get a little understanding of why Philadelphia is the one that gets to go in the marriage first, just like Leah got to get married first. And it says, and to the uh, messenger of the assembly in Philadelphia, right? These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David and he that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. So he, when he talks about works, he's talking about obedience to Torah. Behold, I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it for you have a little strength and have kept my word and has, have not denied my name. Whoa. So there's two things they have. They've got the double portion. They're Torah observant and they don't deny his name. So his mm -hmm. name is the key ingredient. It's it's the fragrance. It's, it's the oil. Now, what does he say to Smyrna? Smyrna is the only other uh, assembly where he doesn't rebuke them like he does the others. He doesn't warn them. You know, be careful. I'm going to take away your candlestick. He doesn't warn Smyrna. He says good works. They have good works. He says, and unto the messenger of the congregation in Smyrna, write these things, says he 
says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty. In other words, he's commending them for their obedience to Torah. And he says, and I know the blasphemy of them that which say they are Yehudim and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He says, fear none of these things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days. Be you faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. So what if you understand what the meaning of Smyrna is, this word Smyrna literally means strengthened for myrrh. Strengthened for myrrh. I'll look it up right here. Smyrna, 4668. Um, it's in my, t I have a blog on this called the 10 days of all. Let me see. Um, days of um, all leading up to Yom Kippur. 10 days of all leading up to Yom Kippur. And in this blog, I go into a lot of detail about the seven congregations in Revelation. And I talk about what their names actually mean. And Smyrna, their name means strengthened for myrrh. Okay, strengthened for myrrh. And what does that mean? Well, you see, who was, who was somebody else that had to prepare themselves with myrrh for six months? Can you guess? Um, gosh. <laughs> uh, it is... Esther, Queen Esther. Yeah, Esther. She right. had to prepare six months with myrrh. It says mm -hmm. in Esther 2 12, now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Hashuaris, and of course the king is symbolic of Yahushua, the king, after mm -hmm. she had been um after she had been 12 months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished. With six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. So six months of myrrh, they have to be cleansed with myrrh because see myrrh is like a, a cleansing agent. They would, you know, be anointed with myrrh and, and be purified. And it also is something they used as an embalming fluid in those days not embalming like, you know, intravenously like we do nowadays, but they would anoint the body with myrrh and wrap it and stuff. So in other words, these, these people, they don't, they have a part, you know, they're, they're partially obeying the Torah, but there's something that they're missing. They don't know his name. Why do mm -hmm. you think that he never says some, he never says to Smyrna, you've not denied my name. But he does say that to Philadelphia. He says, I know your works. You know, you're keeping Torah. Good for you. And you've mm -hmm. not denied my name. So they have the double portion. But but Smyrna, right. he doesn't say anything about the name to them. And he just says, you have good works. You're keeping Torah. That's a good thing. But you're still going to have to suffer tribulation for 10 more days. 10 days. Why? Because there's 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Okay, the Jewish people call it the 10 days of awe. 10 days of awe means 10 days of tribulation. If you look up the word awe in Hebrew, it means tribulation. So during those 10 days, they're going to go buy that oil. I mean, it says right here uh, in Matthew 25. If you go there, go back there. Here it says, and the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. So he's te they're telling them, go and buy the oil. Okay. So, and when the bridegroom came, they weren't ready because they were out there buying. They were too busy buying that they missed their day of visitation. The door was shut. Okay. Mm. Now, 
afterward came also the other virgins saying, Master, 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 open to us. And he said, I know you not. He doesn't say, I never knew you. Remember, when he's separating the sheep from the goats, what does he say? I never knew you. Because, see, the word never has to do with eternity. Because the Greek word there for never means I didn't know you in the past and I don't know. I'm never going to know you in the future either. In other words, it's, it's an it's a word that implies not in the past, not in the present, not in the future. But when he says, yeah. I know you not, he just means at this juncture, I don't know you. But I believe that those foolish virgins are going to go buy the oil. And during those 10 days of tribulation, they're going to be ready for him when he comes back. And that's mm -hmm. what that's I believe those are the Jews the that accepted that won't accept him yet until he comes back. So when mm -hmm. he comes back, they're going to be ready for him. And it says in, in Zechariah 12, where he talks about the kingdom of Judah, he says that he will pour upon the house of Judah, the kingdom of Judah right here. The, you know, he says that he will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the morning of Hadradrimon in the valley of Megiddo. So, you know, he, these are the Jewish people that didn't accept him yet. But during those 10 days, they're going to recognize who he was. You know, these are the ones that didn't take the mark of the beast. The ones that didn't worship the beast. There's going to be a remnant. They're going to be hiding in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And while the other half of the bride is, you know, consummating with the bridegroom in the chuppah, they're going to be like Rachel. They're still waiting to be married to the bridegroom. And they're not going to get resurrected bodies. I don't believe they will at that juncture. Maybe at the end of the millennium, when the new Jerusalem comes down, at that point, they'll get resurrect or, you know, immortal bodies, I should say. But during the millennium, they're probably, you know, they're just still going to be in their natural bodies. Now, they might get resurrected from the dead if they're killed, but that doesn't mean they're going to put on more immortality because there's a difference. You can still be resurrected and still be in your mortal body. But but the ones that are the bride, they will put on incorruption. See that? So I don't know if that yeah. answers your question. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Any more anything else? Any anybody else have questions? Or Maria, do you have an is that uh do you have any extra questions besides that one? No, just that one. Okay. We can just talk about what we'll cover in next week's part three, the final. Just yeah. give a summary. Well, you know, it's, there's a lot to cover still. I mean, there really is. I mean, I'm going to be talking about the Yom Kippur twin goats. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the 40-year Yom Kippur miracle. Um, let's see. I'm going to be talking about the different covenants, you know, seven different covenants. Let's see. What else is there going to be? Uh, enmity and rivalry between the two sisters and the two households causing a breach, you know, uh, the Bible scripture talks about that. We shall be called repairers of the breach. That's in Isaiah. There's also something called the gap theory, which a lot of people don't agree with the gap theory. They say, Oh, there can't be a gap in Daniel 70th week. Well, there is actually, um, historical or biblical, precedent for a gap in a gap in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. Uh, we do have a question from Franco now. Okay. Go ahead, um, Franco. So Franco said, um, what do you mean by going and buying? I'm assuming it's going and buying oil. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, like go, to going, going and buying the oil, um, you know, like Yahushua talks about it, um, in the book of revelation, he says, you know, he talks about ISAV, you know, he talks about buying ISAV that you may be able to see, right? 
See if I can find it. Um, I'm probably not. I think it's all one word. Sometimes it's hard to. I think it's right here. Revelation 3.18. He says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may be able to see. Okay, so that's Revelation 3.18. Let's look it up here. Revelation 3.18. I want to look at the words in the uh, in the concordance here. So when he says buy, you know, it says go to the market, to purchase, to redeem. Um, so he's counseling them to buy of him. But, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that that's a, like a metaphor of, you know, you know, it's like he says that we will, that we would be redeemed without money, right? It's, it says in scripture, that we shall be redeemed without money. Let's see, money. I can find that passage. Um, right here in Isaiah 52 3 it says, For thus says Yahuwah, you have sold yourselves for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. In other words, you know, he, he's saying that that we should go and buy you know, redeem ourselves, right? Redeem ourselves. Uh, I'm not thinking this has to do with literal buying with money, but this has to do with, you know, redeem yourself, you know, go and go and do what you have to do to get yourself ready for the day of redemption. Go and do what you have to do. Go get yourself some oil, go learn the name, go and you know, redeem yourself because this word buy means to redeem. Okay. So it's not talking about a literal buying. Uh, it's talking about, you know, redeem yourself, repent, go and make things right before the day of Yahuwah, before he comes so that you'll be ready. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Anybody else on either live stream in the chat Q and a, uh, it really was uh it's a, it's a good teaching mm-hmm. uh, enjoying it thoroughly mm-hmm. uh one of the things that the 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 ruach has shown me as uh as uh, you know my wife and i we when we get into studying and and um especially when we go in deeper looking at the um the ancient hebrew mm-hmm. And where words come from, where things come from, uh, the Ruach has always uh, cautioned me to be careful when we are studying not to look at things through the lens of our vantage point. Mm -hmm. Because because of where we are and how we've learned, especially with the Greek mindset, Mm -hmm. uh, being taught with the Greek mindset. Right. uh, Yes, some Greek words do match up but most of them don't. Right. <laughs> and so, um, um, so I just wanted to make, kind of make that comment mm-hmm. that uh, uh, for the benefit, for the benefit, especially for the benefit of those that are, are um, l- uh, listening to mm-hmm. uh, what you're teaching. And a lot of what you're teaching is from the ancient Hebrew. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, so the confusion sometimes does come because we're looking at it through the lens of now instead of the lens of the way Yahuwah uh, laid it out in the beginning. Exactly. It's like if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you really need to understand Torah. And that's why I go back to Rachel and Leah. And that's why I go back to that story, because it's a story of the bridegroom with two different brides. And we know that. That's that was not never acceptable. Yahuwah never wanted polygamy. Okay, um, in fact, it was polygamy that caused the the breach in the house in the first place. It was polygamy that caused the two houses of Israel to be split. Okay, um, it was because of Solomon's sin of taking all his wives, and he became so uh, you know beholden to those wives that he built ta- you know temples for them. 
And he was taxing the people heavily that Yahuwah brought judgment on Solomon and tore the kingdom away from him. But he told him he was going to do it after he died. He said after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam would uh, get the smaller part of the kingdom, which would be Judah and Benjamin. And then the other 10 tribes would be ruled by King Jeroboam. So King Rehoboam, which was Solomon's son, he took the two southern tribes and King Jeroboam took the two northern tribes. And so it was because of his idolatry that this happened. And so it was because of polygamy. It was because of plural marriage and Solomon's sin with multiple wives that caused the breach in the house. And so, you know, when I talk about the two, the two brides, Leah and Rachel, and how they're likened under the two houses of Israel, people go, oh, she's teaching polygamy. No, no, just the opposite. <laughs> I'm showing how polygamy caused problems in the house. And it's because of polygamy that there is a gap in the house. Yeah, recognizing there was polygamy is not the same as approving of polygamy. Exactly. But people get, you know, when I start talking about there being two brides, they go, oh, she's talking about two brides. That's, oh, no, she's teaching polygamy. No, 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 no. I'm not teaching that at all. I'm saying that the two brides will become one bride when Yahushua returns. He's going to take the two sticks and make them one stick. So, but we can't act like there aren't two sticks. We can't act like there aren't two brides. We can't act like there's not two houses. We can't pretend that that's not the case. You know? Yep, I agree. Yeah, you know, something you said too, Servando, um, you know, about looking looking at things through the, the ancient lens, the Hebrew lens, mm -hmm. um, or the um, Middle Eastern Semitic lens. You know, sometimes we see words and the right word is chosen in scripture. You like the, you know, the, the way it's modern translation or even you know, the King James translation. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the right word is, is used, but the meaning of that word has changed. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at all the possible meanings and some of the meanings, even though they're within the definition of the word, they've fallen out of, of use. People no longer say that when they mean this or when they mean that they only use it in a more narrow sense so in our right. in our modern way of looking at things it's like we only see three options of, of of the definition and you go back further and it was like oh you know two thousand years ago or a thousand years ago 800 years ago that word had a wider variance and in context you can see that some of those mm -hmm. definitions that are no longer in 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 use um really are the ones that apply Right. Like, uh, for instance, we, um, when we were looking at, uh, um, Maria's expounding on the word, uh, new as mm -hmm. in new covenant or, uh, Hadash. Actually, when you look back at that in the ancient Hebrew, it, everything reverts back to renewed. It mm -hmm. always reverts back to renewed. Mm -hmm. And when you look, uh, look at it from the vantage point of, uh, the example, I guess, would be when the moon, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes. when yeah, when the moon comes up and and mm -hmm. comes over, and you get the the various the, the various phases, um, it goes to full, um, and then well, it starts with nothing, and then goes to full, and then goes all the way back to nothing. It's always there. Yes. Uh, it never dis. It, it actually never disappears. Right. So the way the image of what we see is being renewed continuously. That's right. That's right. Yep. Exactly. Everything's cyclical. Everything. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. That's, Everything. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I I use the same example when I'm talking to Christians. I'll say, yeah, it's just like the moon is renewed every month. It's not a different moon every month. When we say new moon, it sounds like we're saying, oh, it's a totally different moon. Like every month he has to, Yahuwah has to create a brand new moon. No, it's the same moon that he set in the sky from the creation. It's the same one, but it's renewed because every month, you know, we have a full cycle. And so the cycle renews itself. So, yeah, exactly. Um, well, and even in the sense that was a really great example 
in our modern day, when you mention the moon, everyone recognizes, oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's not a brand new rock out there. It's, it's the same rock. It's another cycle of light to dark. Right. That's all the same. But when they look at ancient things, they, they somehow even forget that, the, that they use the word different now and that they're holding it to a different context then. I was thinking, you know, even when modern day Christianity looks at, you know, what Mashiach did, he died and resurrected. And then that, that sacrifice, that atonement, he renewed himself to us, but they look at it as if it's a brand new thing. Well, well, God did a brand new thing, you know, and there's, there's only one real Messiah. Mm -hmm. But if you look before Messiah came, there's, there's, you know, crazy examples of everything being, he restores, he restores to himself, he restores to himself. Right. right. So in that sense, right. it's not a new thing. No. Nope. You know, everything <laughs> was pointing to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tom, Thomasina um, asked a question about, um, do you think Ron Wyatt was telling the truth about the blood on the mercy seat? Yes, absolutely. I, talk about that in some of my blogs. In fact, let me go to the one where it's called the oneness of the father and the son. Okay. And in that blog, I talk about the blood that was, uh, that Ron Wyatt had tested, um, on the mercy seat. Let me see if I can find it here. There it is. Okay. So, uh, Ron Wyatt, the late archaeologist, discovered that Messiah did not have human blood, per se. Leviticus 17.11 declares that the life of the flesh is in the blood. This means that the life of the Heavenly Father was in the blood of our Messiah. When Yahushua died as he hung on the tree, there was an earthquake immediately following his death, and the earth split at the same time that the temple curtain or the veil was torn in half. Matthew 27, 54. His blood dripped from off of his body and through the crack in the earth below to where Jeremiah had hidden the Ark of the Covenant many years earlier before the Babylonian captivity. And of course, we, we come to know that as Jeremiah's grotto. They call it Jeremiah's grotto because he hid the, um, the Ark so that they wouldn't capture, the Babylonians wouldn't capture the ark. This means that the blood dripped from where he hung on the tree onto the mercy seat below. According to the research of Ron Wyatt, Messiah's blood contained only 24 chromosomes. You see, every human being is born with 46 chromosomes, 23 from our mother and 23 from our father. Each person receives 22 autosomes from their mother and 22 autosomes from their father. When a human being is being formed in the womb, the baby receives an X chromosome from their mother and either an X or a Y chromosome from their father, which will determine the gender of the child. If the child is going to be a female, she receives an X from her mother and an X from her father. But if the child is going to be male, he receives an X from his mother and a Y chromosome from his father. Yahushua was born with 22 autosomes from his mother, Miriam, and then one X chromosome from her, okay, totaling 23 chromosomes. And then he received a Y chromosome from his heavenly father, which determined that his gender would be male. Okay. So he, when I say he didn't have human blood, what I mean is it, his blood did not match the average human being. He had only 24 chromosomes where the uh, rest of us are born with 46 chromosomes. So he got the one Y chromosome from his heavenly father and he got the 22 uh, or 23 chromosomes from his mother. Okay. So he, he, you know, he, he got the physical attributes of his mother, the physical body 
Okay, but the blood was perfect. It had to be because the blood had to be sinless. So if it wasn't sinless, he couldn't have been a proper sacrifice because the bl the blood of the lamb had to be perfect and spotless. So he couldn't have inherited the sin of his ancestors, you know, from his mother, Miriam. He couldn't have inherited their blood. But some people might say, well, how is that possible? How could he be born of his mother, Miriam? You know, how did the blood not, you know, the blood of the, his ancestors not affect him, right? So the placenta acts as the giant clearinghouse. And let me find that spot here. Yeah, it says the child's umbilical, umbilical cord is attached to the placenta. It is the placenta which is attached to the mother. The placenta acts like a giant clearinghouse for the baby, taking nutrients and other things out of the mother's blood and passing them onto the baby's bloodstream through the umbilical cord. So in other words, the, the baby's blood never touches the mother's blood when the baby's in the womb. So the, the placenta uh, transfers the nutrients to the baby, but that's why... Um, a baby can have a different blood type than its mother, okay? Because the, because the blood of the mother and the blood of the baby do not mingle. They do not mingle, okay? And so therefore, he could still have all the physical attributes of his mother without the contamination of the blood. The blood in his veins was the Heavenly Father's blood. It was perfect and spotless and that's why he had to possess both natures at the same time. He had to be 100% human, and he also had to be 100% Elohim at the same time. So, Because he had to be spotless and sinless. If he wasn't spotless and sinless, he could not have taken uh, away our sins. Because it says in Exodus 12 that the Passover lamb must be perfect and spotless. And so, but he also had to be human in order to stand in the gap for us. He had to take our place. If he didn't come as a human being, he could not have been our advocate. He had to be someone that was just like us in that regard, that we are of the same species or, you know, we were created after his image and likeness. So we, he had to be both a hundred percent human and a hundred percent. Elohim or divine at the same time. And so Ron Wyatt's, um, you know, blood samples on the mercy seat really proves that. And I, I really uh, love the fact that he found that because it really helps us uh, explain how he could be both, have both natures at the same time. So anybody else? I just brought up, if you want to talk about the significance of the 1119 lunar eclipse and the abomination that causes desolation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just thought that was just interesting because I was doing a Google search and the other night I was looking for how the lunar eclipse might have, uh, you know, impacted um you know, what the significance of the lunar eclipse might have had prophetically for, you know, Israel. And, you know, because everything that's going on with prophecy in these last days um, has, to, you know, Israel's kind of like the place where, it, you know, prophecy is taking place the most. So I, I, I posted this just yesterday, last night's lunar eclipse of 11, 19, 2021, marks the anniversary of the abomination that causes desolation. There was a total lunar eclipse that occurred during the actual initial fulfillment of this prophecy when Antiochus Epiphanes did desecrated the temple in 167 BC or 168 BC on Kislev 15th. This event is directly related to the festival of Hanukkah. Even though this article was first published in uh, 20. 2017, it has resurfaced again when I did a search on DuckDuckGo last night, and that would have been a couple nights ago when I did this, uh, last night's lunar eclipse. 
This appeared to be an ominous sign that the eclipse is something prophetic, uh, setting something prophetic into motion. So this is an old article from 2017, but I thought it was interesting that when I did a, a search um, for the eclipse uh, in Israel, I, I found I came upon this article. And it says, Sanhedrin calls for Trump to fulfill King Solomon's mandate by praying on the Temple Mount. And it says, the Sanhedrin sent a letter on Monday to U.S. President Donald Trump calling him to ascend. Of course, that was in 2017. Calling to his, him to ascend to the Temple Mount and pray for world peace when he arrives in Jerusalem next week for his first state visit. Now, what's interesting is the word ascend, okay, and where else have we seen someone ascending above the heights of the heavens? Well, that's uh, Isaiah, Yeshayahu 14, 13 says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Elohim. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Um, verse 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So I just thought that was interesting that the Sanhedrin said that they were calling him to ascend to the Temple Mount. It almost seemed like, you know, they're giving us a hint about something that was going to happen in the future. So I just thought that was interesting. Now, of course, this article was from the other night, the 19th, and it says meaning of super rare blood moon. I don't agree with everything in this article, but, uh, it says right here, you know, um, this is where I got the, where it says, talks about the total lunar eclipse occurred, occurred initially. Now they said Kislev 15th. I think that's a typo. It's supposed to be the 25th. So I got to fix that. It's not the 15th. It's it, scripture tells us it's 25th. Um, so, uh, you know, and it shows the coin, <clears throat> Antiochus, the coin of Antiochus, you know, and what do we have now? We've got Trump's face on the coin, <laughs> yeah. you know, on the temple coin. So there's, it seems like history is repeating itself. Um, <clears throat> the part I, I probably don't agree with here is that they are using the Jewish calendar right here. Um they're, when they're counting the years, they're counting the, you know, the Jewish calendar uses the years before the, after the flood. They don't count the years before the flood. So there, I forget what year it is in the, in the Jewish, Jewish calendar year, um, calendar year. Uh, they're going by, let's see, what is the, it, right now it's the year 5782 according to the Jewish calendar. And we know that that still leaves a lot of, um, let's see, if we were to go by that, <laughs> minus 5782, we would have to wait 218 days before Messiah, 218 years, excuse me, before Messiah uh -huh. could come back. And we don't, we don't believe that, that we're going to have to wait that long. So because the Jewish calendar does not include the years before the flood. So that's the only piece of this article that I didn't agree with is they're using the Jewish calendar, uh, which they call it the Hebrew calendar, but it's, that's the only part I don't agree with because it's, um, they're showing all these events based on the, the Jewish calendar calendar that does not include the years before the flood. So that's, that's really all. But thanks for reminding me of that. Some people thought after they read it, they said, hey, Maria, this is from 2017. I said, yeah, I know. I know it is. I, m the only reason I brought it up is because I thought it was interesting that when I did a search on the eclipse, this that article came up again. So it was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. That's all. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> so Lily says, who could say then that the father shed his own blood through his son? That's an excellent question. And I've got the answer. Uh, I think I'm going to look up a different blog because I think in this blog, uh, it shows it shows the illustration here. Yeah, it's this blog right here. 
Zechariah chapter 12. It says, I'm going to start with verse 6. In that day, will I, okay, when he says I, he's referring, to, this is Yahuwah speaking of himself in the first person. Okay. Uh, in that day, will I, and then right after that, in the Hebrew text, it shows Aleph and Ta. I, Aleph and Ta, make the governors of Yehuda or Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Yerushalayim shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Yerushalayim. Then in verse 7, it says Yahuwah, and then right after Yahuwah, it says Aleph and Ta again. Aleph and Ta, first and last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Yahuwah also shall save the tents of Yehuda, that's Judah, first, that the glory of the house of Dawid, or David, and the glory of the inhabitants of Yerushalayim do not magn magnify themselves against Yehuda. In that day shall Yahuwah defend the inhabitants of Yerushalayim, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as Dawid, and the house of Dawid shall be as Elohim, as the angel or the messenger, Malak of Yahuwah, before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I, and he's speaking of himself in the first person, I, Aleph and Ta, will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Now, this is the verse where I think it's most important here. And it says, and I will pour upon the house, the inhab I will pour upon the house of Dawid and upon the inhabitants um, of Yerushalayim, um, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon who? Aleph and Ta. They shall look upon me. So Yahuwah is, the, Yahuwah is speaking of himself in the first person. He's like, they will look upon me, the Aleph and the Ta, who they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. So first he speaks of himself in the first person, but then he says they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his first, firstborn. So you will notice that the me and the him are the same person who was pierced because the father and the son are one. And people say, oh, well, they're just one in, you know, they're just one in purpose. No, they're one in essence and substance. Why do you think he says the father is in me and I am in the father? I am in the father and the father is in me. In other words, they are inseparable that, you know, well, and when you take scripture talking about, you know, the the bride, I will go back to my first husband, right? Mm -hmm. When you when you look at that, and then you look at the idea that where in scripture do we see where the where the ex husband makes a way for his son to marry his ex wife? <laughs> exactly. That is nowhere in scripture, and I'm pretty sure <laughs> that that would be called an abomination. Yes. Exactly. You don't marry your stepmom. <laughs> That's right. Yes, exactly, Lily. We could say then the father shed his own blood through his son. Because, see, the father is invisible. He has no, no physical form of his own. He's invisible. No man has seen the father at any time. He's a disembodied spirit. But the son has a physical form that we can see. He's the visible image of the invisible Elohim. And scripture even tells us that. It says, um, visible, invisible. Right? Let's find that passage of scripture. And it's in Colossians 1.16. It says, for by him, meaning Yahushua, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities. Okay, that's not the passage I wanted, though. Hang on. Um, invisible see right here and it's in Romans 120 or no Colossians 115 who is the uh, image of the invisible Elohim the firstborn of every creature 
Now right here it says, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise Elohim, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Father is invisible. He's in, he is a disembodied spirit, but the Son is his physical body. The Son is his image. So if I could say that my body is a separate being from myself, in a sense, it's like my body is part of me and my spirit is part of me and my emotions are part of me. So I've, I've got a soul and a spirit and a mind and a body, but they're all me. It's not like there's, it's not like I'm a separate person from me. (laughs) You know what I mean? So the son is the body and the father is the spirit. If that makes sense. Does that make sense, guys? Makes sense to me. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. I appreciate it. Any more questions? Anybody else? Okay. Let's uh, close out in a prayer. Okay. Father Yahuwah, we just worship you and you praise you, Father. We just ask that you would bless those who who have been here and those who couldn't make it and all our brothers and sisters around the world, wake us all up that you would um, help us to hear your voice, that you would speak to us clearly, that you would take the wax out of our spiritual ears, Father, and uh, show us what we're to do. Show us how we're to maneuver through these times. We know sticking to your word and walking in your Torah is the path, but that's that's vague sometimes in, in terms of how we we handle the circumstances that come our way. Um, so, Father, we just ask for a unique and individual direction in our many decisions that come before us. Uh, we just ask your provision and your guidance in Yehushua HaMashiach's name. Well, then I guess we will sign off and we will talk to you guys next week. Uh, Shabbat Shalom and Shabbat Tov. And we will see you then. You who will bless you and keep you, you who will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, you who will lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast and that you are encouraged in your walk with Messiah. For more teachings, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified of our latest content. Visit Maria's many blogs at doubleportioninheritance.com. That's doubleportioninheritance.com. This ministry is made possible by the prayers and support of listeners like you. To make a donation by PayPal or Venmo.com, use the email address doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. That's doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. On behalf of Maria and Gary at Double Portion Inheritance Ministries, may Yahuwah bless you.